Okay, so what we have for today is um, first we having the chart. Those of you who didn't take the chart yesterday, if you can take one of each of the pages that are here in front, because we have a chart. We said um, we discussed yesterday that the, it was very important to predict how much water comes with the gas. Okay. What water that comes with the oil from the formation that we can, um, it, has, it has some solubility in the hydrocarbon, okay? But the most important effect is the, the water that is dissolved in solution in the gas. Okay, so that's what our main focus here. And for many cases, it can have a lot of consequences that we have to be careful. And we said we have two main options or two main uh, uh, possibilities to model this, um, the water, what happens with the water. Correlation, remember correlation, we measure for a particular range we do in the lab or in the field. And then we have to be careful that we are using that expression for those particular conditions. If you use it outside, it might be a good chance that, you know, it doesn't apply anymore. Or the other approach is you're going to be using it next week. It's using an equation of state. Just like what we did before, we're using Penn Robinson, using Heises, you use an equation of state, but sometimes you have to adjust, you have to tweak it a little bit, okay? By, by changing, in this case, for example, I gave you an example by changing the beeps, the binary interaction coefficient. Then we said, well, what does the chart is telling us, okay? And then we came to this concept very much used in petroleum engineering, that you make a volume ratio. First you take a volume at any pressure and temperature, and you take it to surface, okay? It can be very simple, you're simply expanding it on a piston with the same composition, or it can be very complicated, you're passing it through a whole process. And then here you have to solve all of these separation stages. But at the end, you end up with a volume of oil, volume of oil from oil, volume of gas from oil, volume of oil from gas, and volume of gas from gas. Yeah. And then you define these crazy parameters that these are the ones that we use in our calculation. Okay. And the usefulness is that you generate that either from laboratory, from correlation, or even using uh, re uh, equation of state simulator but then you don't have to make computations anymore. Okay, you just can directly use these parameters. So in a similar fashion, we define one parameter for water. First we said, well, we have the water volume factor that relates the volume of water at any pressure and temperature with the volume of water at standard conditions. Okay, we said this should be always very close to one. Depending on our water, depending on the pressure, but it should be fairly close to, usually to one, okay? 1.01 something. And then we said, if we have some gas, now we have to consider that it doesn't release only oil, okay? Which is a small RS. Now it's releasing also water at standard condition. And that's exactly <coughs> the ratio between these two, the red one and the blue one, that's the ratio what is giving the chart. Okay, they did a lot of measurements and they found out that chart where you enter with the temperature that you have at any position. Remember, we are assuming the gas is saturated with water at any position in the production system. Okay? So you take temperature, you cross it with pressure, and we have to be careful with the units. These are in kilopascals, our pressure in Norwegian units, in field units, they are typically in bar. Okay? I have to cross it, and then I read from here how much, what is that ratio. Okay. I remember that ratio is at the surface, but then I have to convert it to, so that I'm finding this value, okay? If I have the volume of gas or the rate of gas, I'm finding this number, and then to convert back, I have to use that B, BW, okay? Okay, and then we came to this exercise, and that's what I want to, to cover today, that we start from the reservoir, so that we know the maximum 
Usually it's reading very much by the temperature. Okay, the pressure is making some change on the chart. If you see here, the pressure is making a change. But really, the biggest change is on the temperature. Okay, this inclination, this is very inclined, so if you have a small change in temperature, that's making a big change on the y-axis. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> we started here, first to know how much is contained, how much is saturated there, so that's how we find that number. And then we go and calculate at different positions in my production system. And that ratio will be different. That means that if you take this gas at this position and take it to surface, it will give you a different number than if you take this gas and take it to surface. So the difference has to be someplace, right? You have to have conservation of mass. So you will see now, if we have a difference, okay, that means that we have some water that came out of solution, that dropped out of solution. Okay? And that's the intention. For that, we are not going to use the plot anymore. Okay? We have a set of equations that represent the plot. That, that's what we are going to use. Um, Okay, and also I told you if you want to get it exactly in the units that are shown here, then you have to make some conversion. Okay, you have to convert from mass to volume using the density, and then you have to convert from this number is usually very small. Okay, it's three to the minus three. So to have it more in a more convenient way, people make it in terms of million. In this case, I put mega here for the SI system, and that gives you the same number that is there. Okay, but you know, you have to, there were a lot of things that happened in between. Okay, so I suggest we, if you want to do it with me, that's fine. Um, if not, you know, I will just do it here, but you have to be careful I'm doing things okay. Okay, so we started with this point, right? And we went to our chart. So let's say, so that's the first part. Okay, so let's just verify that calculation we have made. Okay, we came here with reservoir pressure, which was 90. This is a field in the Barents Sea called uh, Snow White, Snowbit. It's operated by Equinor. And we have reservoir pressure 90. We go up and we knock it with the pressure 276. 276 bar, it's, I have to multiply by 100, okay, to get it in kilopascal. That correct? Okay, so 27,000, I knock it, it's someplace between 20 and 30, closer to 30. So it's like 3,500. Milligram, be careful with the units. Milligram per standard cubic meter. Then I simply multiply times the divide by the density. Mm -hmm. And then finally I multiply by one million to take it to million. Okay, so that seems to be fine. We're going to find out very soon. So now about how we can do it, you know, we're always occupied, if we have to read from a chart, we need human interaction. If you have to read for a chart, let's say you want to make this calculation, now not only in four points, but you have to do it, let's say, 10 points for every well, and you have a field of 50 wells. It's going to take you some effort to read from the chart, okay? So that was very useful, you know, 70s, 80s, 60s, to have a chart, okay? because you just wanted to focus on the most important. But now we want an issue that we have many, many wells and we want to make the calculation fast. Okay, so that's why we prefer an expression. That expression is in chapter nine that we discussed last class from the monograph of uh, Professor Whitson. If you go to the section where you have RSW, Okay, solubility of water in natural gas, 9.2.7. And then you see you have the chart, which is slightly poor, uh, poor quality than what we have. Also different units for field units, but it's basically the same. 
and then you have a best fit equation for this chart. That's what we want, okay? To have an equa to have an equation is, and they give a whole a whole uh, set of equations that you have to use. Okay, and at the end that gives you RSW. In this case, they are using field units, so it's standard barrels per million standard cubic feet. Okay. But if you go now to this uh, um, Excel file, you punch Alt F11, you find exactly the same equation program here. Okay, So you don't have to actually, here is making all the steps that you need. You have to calculate Okay, let's make it bigger. You have to calculate uh, YW with YWO, which is uh, the mole fraction of water for, it says here. Well, you can read this part if you want more details, but it's uh, basically the mole fraction of water Doesn't say here. Very strange. I think that's not corrected by by salinity. I think. Okay, so is a is a mole fraction of water at saturation, but not corrected by salinity. It, the AG and AS are corrected are correction terms due to the salinity of the water. Okay, in our case, they were going to be zero. But the thing is that the point is that you have exactly the same equation that we have programmed here. A1, I call it A1, G minus 0 0.55, 1.5, 10 to the 4 times specific gravity. Okay, so it's exactly the same equation. You can come and verify. Sometimes some students, they have found some errors on the VBA function, so that's, uh, it's nice that you check it. Okay, but very important, check the units. So here it says pressure has to be input in bar, temperature in Celsius, gas gravity, you have to use, of course, remember the gas gravity of a gas, how do we express it? Specific gravity of a gas is the molecular weight of the gas divided by the molecular weight of air. Okay, So we have 28.97 and here we have molecular weight of gas. So that's a fraction and okay and then the result is giving you in kilogram per million Okay, or per mega, standard cubic meter. So let's try to use that for, instead of using, using it here, okay, let's try to use, instead of reading the value from the chart, just let's try to use it in here. Okay, so we are going to use RSW in kilogram per million. just to, to use everything to be consistent. Okay, and here we use the equation, and the equation has the name RSW and gives you the units, okay? Kilogram per million cubic meter. <clears throat> okay, pressure in bar, so I, uh, that's some um, lucky, it's in the same units, temperature 90, specific gravity of the gas 0. 0.55, so that's very close, it's a very uh, met methane-like gas, the gas from Snow White, and the water salinity we're using zero, okay? If you have, if you see on the plot that, that I gave you, you have some correction factor depending on the density of the gas, on the specific density of the gas, specific gravity of the gas, and depending on the salinity. 
Okay, you can also have some correction factors due to the CO2 and the S, S, uh, um, H2S. Okay. Because these are gases that they tend to be, you know, they tend to attract water very much. So usually when you have CO2 or H2S, the solubility, this RS tends to be bigger. Okay, it tends to contain much more water. Okay, so you see here, what did I find? That should be in blue because it's a calculated value. Okay, 3, 360, so we were not so far away considering we are doing it with the naked eye. Okay, what difference is that? Is like, uh, is it 10% between these two? Yeah, maybe less, 5%. Okay, so it's, it's okay. And this number is simply, we know that they are equivalent, okay? The units are, are equivalent. And let's take, let's not look at the water here because it doesn't make sense to talk about water in the reservoir, okay? Because you have a flow, the reservoir actually is a big tank, okay? But that's how much is dissolved in, in, in the reservoir gas. Let's go now to another condition of pressure and temperature. Now we are moving at the wellhead. So let's make a sketch of our pro production system. So we are all clear where we are. Production system. So this, this field has a big transportation pipeline that takes it to, this field is actually in the, in the Barents Sea in a place close to Hammerfest. Anybody here from Hammerfest? No? From Alta? Narvik? No? Nobody? No Nurlendinge here? Okay. So we have, I think there are a bit, there are like 12 or maybe nine wells. I'm not exactly sure how many are in production now, but you have a few cluster of wells, that's what we call a cluster. Okay, they are producing through this flow line and through the main pipeline. And this is on shore. Okay, it's an island called Melköya. And that's, uh, this is offshore and that distance is approximately 146 kilometers okay, away. And it's purely this gas, which is very first, is very has very low liquid condensate, but has water, which is a problem. And now we are looking at the reservoir actually, okay? So the reservoir is actually here, all wells are draining from the same reservoir. So this circle is a well. So now we started at the reservoir, we found out how much we have there, and now we want to find out how much there is, if we look at one schematic of a single well, Okay, we have our reservoir, then we have this point that we call PWF, the bottom hole, or the bottom of the well. Okay, then we have this point, which is that we call PWH. Okay. Then we have, typically we have an adjustment element, because the well, if we leave it with no control, it can produce much more. Okay, so we have to keep it choked. We have to keep it under control. And then we have a flow line. Here it, co it merges with other wells. And then it has the flow line. And then you have the plem. Okay, that's this point here. That's what we call the plem pipeline entry module. Okay, so we are, and here finally we have separator. Okay, so basically we are going to look only at four points because of time. Okay, we are going to look at the reservoir. We're going to look at the wellhead. We're going to look at the downstream of the choke, PDC. And then we're going to look at the separator conditions. Okay, so these are all the points we're going to look at. Okay, so... Let's go first wellhead. Okay, simply we should be able to drag this down. Okay, and you see the difference actually. 
That means, okay, at the wellhead, because basically the temperature is lower and the pressure is lower, it cannot take a, this amount of water, okay? It cannot take 3,300, okay? It can take less. So the difference between these two, what happened with that? Has to be, has free water, okay? That means that already at the wellhead, and maybe even someplace between reservoir and wellhead, you know, we have a lot of dropping of water coming out of solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here I'm going to take a very, very short comment on water in wells, in gas wells, okay? Can uh, cause uh, something that is called liquid loading. Mm -hmm. So if you see, let's make a drawing of the tubing, okay, we're going to look at this pipe where these fluids are transported, okay. So initially we have purely gas, okay? then you start having out of solution, there comes this water, starts to drop, but still it's not that much, okay, so it's, we have, it's a very fine spray, but the gas has enough capability to carry it out. It just can carry out. But then if you continue, you start having <clears throat> this, um, this water starts maybe to sticking to the walls. Okay. And then you have a bigger droplets, some bigger droplets. Here. Okay. Until finally you come at the situation where you have so much gas so much liquid, okay, that basically the gas just, it, it becomes, it separates, it forms like a flow pattern, these are called flow patterns, okay, so this we call single phase flow, this we call mist flow, okay, it's like a mist, like a spray, spray type flow, simply you are carrying everything, so everything go, is fine so far. Here is becoming to start, they start becoming dangerous. You have too much liquid, and then this gas has a lot of, has to make a lot of effort to take it out of the well. Okay, and finally you have the case where the liquid, you have so much liquid that it makes some sort of a plug. Okay, and then you have intermittent flow of liquid and gas. And the main problem with this flow pattern, okay, is that creates, is called slug flow, and this is called annular flow. Okay. And for this, the delta P, the pressure drop, okay, is higher than for the other case. Okay. Simply because you have liquid, liquid has a high viscosity, so more liquid, more water. Okay, more water, higher viscosity. Remember, the, the gas has a very low viscosity. Higher viscosity, also higher density. Okay. When you have the mixture, if you see that really you have a mixture, if you add more liquid, the mixture will have a density closer to the liquid, not closer to the gas. So this causes at the end a higher delta P. And higher delta P can, you know, reduce the production rate, okay? So eventually, ultimately, reduce the production rate. But also, this liquid loading phenomena that I was saying is that basically, liquid accumulates, starts accumulating in the well. Okay, that's another consequence we have. Reduced production rate and the liquid starts accumulating in the well. All of that liquid that the gas cannot lift it, cannot take it out of the well, simply is going to, like, simply is going to, you know, just slip down. It's going to slip down and accumulate at the bottom of the well. So if you see your well, let's make now the casing. Here we have our tubing. 
Okay, that's a simple way I make a well. The tubing, and that's the formation someplace here. Okay, simply what you have is that the liquid has been slipping down and at the end is making some kind of a blockage. Okay, in front of the formation. And that blockage is, is bad because it makes also like a additional back pressure against the, the gas coming out. Okay, the gas is starting to come out. It may be in forms of bubbles and then it has a hard time to come out. So we don't like this problem and we have to be very careful and we have to know exactly how much liquid we have. Okay, so just a small uh, detour, but just to tell you why it's important, you know, to be careful with the amount of liquid in the, in the well. Okay, now we come, let's see what happens at the choke, okay? Here in this choke we have a pressure drop of um, 40 bar across the choke. But in this case the temperature was not measured. Okay, so now we are moving, if we look at our drawing here, we are moving from wellhead to the discharge of the choke. So we have that pressure was measured. Typically I have on the Christmas tree, I have a pressure transducer, but I don't have the temperature. Okay. So for gas in a southern expansion, Okay, like for example, we have a choke, okay, choke is a southern expansion. Any place where you have a big and concentrated pressure drop, so um, large and concentrated pressure drop, it can also be, remember this scaling problem that I told you about. Okay, where you have these minerals coming out of, out of uh, solution from the water. If you have this case, okay, you have some minerals that are here in, in solution in the water. Let's make with maybe this color. Okay. And then they also, by changes of pressure and temperature, they might just stick to the wall. Okay, and they can stick with time, and at the end they make a blockage. Okay, they can make a, so if we see our tubing, if we have a magnifying glass, Okay. We can see that sometimes we have simply a reduced cross-section area, okay, because of scaling, because you have this scaling buildup with time when we have water. So scale, uh, so let's call it scaled uh, plug, plug, okay, or scale restriction. I think I have a. Um, it's not a very good picture. It's a photo I have. Okay. Something like that. So you create a lot of buildup of this scale in the in the tubing. Okay, so there I might have also sudden expansion. Okay, expansion means basically the pressure is reduced and the volume is, is increased. Okay, so that's what we call, that's the tubing. I have it in my office if you want to, I didn't bring it today. And here it's uh, the scale. Okay, now when I have that, okay, the temperature is also changing. due to the pressure change. Okay, due to the pressure drop. So, you probably had a course in thermodynamics before, right? What can we say about the process of expansion through a valve? How is it? How can we characterize it? If we have a valve, okay, you probably saw it, it looks, we process engineers, we like they like to make it like that, okay? We have conditions one, conditions two, and what they did was, well, we create a control volume around this valve, okay? And we make simply the first law of the thermodynamics, okay? Energy that comes out 
should be equal to energy that comes comes in is equal to energy that comes out and then should also be equal to the heat and to work right that's first law so what did they tell you about valve what happens in a valve we have a lot of process right you say isothermal isobatic you have iso isentropic Isenthalpic or polytropic? You saw all of those? Yeah? Isothermal, same temperature. Isobatic, same pressure. Uh, isentropic, same entropy. Isenthalpic, same enthalpy. And polytropic? Something strange, right? PV to the N equal constant. Okay? So what is this process here? How do we, in a valve, is isenthalpic, okay? Isenthalpic. Basically, H1 is equal to H2. Why? Because we say, well, the changes in kinetic energy, potential energy, they are not very big, okay? We have no exchange of heat or work with the environment, okay? So, that, therefore, the energy has to be conserved. Okay, and the energy is conserved in the way of the enthalpy. The pressure is different, okay? Therefore, uh, the enthalpy is, is conserved. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to use on this second chart that I gave you, okay? On methane. Remember, Snow White, we're saying, is very close to methane. Okay, so they came, I make this chart. Okay, let's make, I will pull it here. And you can have chart for many different gases, okay? But we, I just prefer to use this methane. Okay, go, just go away. Okay, that's actually generated by a professor here at NTNU with a program, but can be also made with lab measurements. Okay, and that's very interesting because it tells you <clears throat> a lot of information about, about the behavior, okay? So if you see here, I have enthalpy, which is something nice, okay? I know it's conserved. From one to two, it remains the same, okay? So I know that enthalpy is not changing my process. And I have pressure, okay? Which pressure is changing in my, in my process. So now let's see all the different curves I have. This area here that I have inside, that's the two-phase region. That means for those combination of pressure and enthalpy, okay, then I will be in two-phase method. Okay? If you see here, you have some lines that tell you the temperature. Okay? And the temperature, they are a bit strange lines. Okay? They go, let me just mark one so you can see. You don't get too confused with too many lines. It okay, has a line temperature. Okay, and that's that's four hundred. That's four hundred and fifty. Therefore, this is four hundred and twenty. This line. This line is for T hundred and twenty C. Okay, they go ten by ten. This one is 100, 110, 20, 30, 40, and 50, okay? So we have those lines of temperature, and then we have, on top of it, we have also lines of ent entropy, which is very useful. If you look at compression, compression, sometimes they like to use isentropic processes, okay? So let's not look at entropy for now, but just be aware, here we have some lines that are at equal entropy. Okay, so now let's start, for our example, going back to our problem we had. Okay, we came from the formation, wellhead, and now we are here. And of this point, we have only the pressure. Okay, we said 160 bar. But we want to know also the temperature. We need the temperature downstream the choke. Okay, so let's start 
we but we know also that the enthalpy, okay, WH should be equal to the enthalpy of downstream the choke. Right? We just found it now. So we have two thermodynamic properties. We have temperature and we have enthalpy, and that should be enough to find everything else. Sorry, we have pressure and we have enthalpy. Okay, so let's look on our chart. Okay, we let's see what values did we have. Wellhead pressure. Oh, it's here. Wellhead pressure 160 and 70. So let's locate that point here. Okay, 70, the line of 70, let me mark it. You can also help me with your 60, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Okay, so it will be this line here. I think. Okay, that's the line of temperature equals 70. Now, how do we, we have a pressure of 180 bar, 160 bar. How do we change that to megapascal? 160 bar to megapascal. How much is megapascal? 10 to the 6 pascals, right? How much is bar? Hmm? By 10, okay? So be careful, that's some of the challenges we have in engineering, okay? We like some set of units and you find charts and equations and everything in all kind of other set of units, okay? So we have 16 megapascal. So how much, where should I place that point? It's a logarithmic, logarithmic scale, right? So here we have 10, 20, right? 30 and so forth. So it should be someplace in between, let's say is around here. Do you agree? Yes. Roughly, okay? So we come here and knock with the line of 70. And we find, very interesting, we find the enthalpy. The enthalpy is zero in that case. Okay, I don't, I, that's the data from the field, so, so it was not done intentionally. So. Okay, now I move to the next point. So that will be my point one. Okay, that will be the wellhead, okay, or the point one. And now I have to move to point two, which is downstream of the choke. What pressure do I have downstream of the choke? Okay, and here is going to be difficult. Okay, PDC is 120, I think. Okay, 120. To megapascal, that will be 12 megapascals. Okay, and 12 is closer, let's say maybe here. Okay. Now I don't have the temperature, right? For 12 for for the condition 2, but I know the enthalpy is the same. So the process is like that. That means that that's my point number 2. It has the same enthalpy, but it has a lower pressure. So that's the DC point or point number 2. Okay? What temperature do I have there? Around 60. Okay, the temperature downstream the choke is around 60 Celsius. Okay. Not much, but it, you know, it's a drop from of, you know, 10, 10 degrees that you have in that valve. Okay, so let's fill that information here, 60. And and be careful, that's something that happens with, with gas, okay? You have, due to the reduction in pressure, and that also happens in pipe, okay? Due to the reduction in pressure, you have also reduction in temperature. How do you call this effect? 
Anybody of you remembers? Some Thompson guy, okay, Joule Thompson effect. That's the effect you have when you have a reduction in pressure, you can also have a reduction in temperature, okay? Because the gas, when it expands, it tends also to cool. Okay, so that effect can have this cooling effect can be very significant. Okay? Uh, especially across chokes. Because in the choke, you have a very big pressure drop. So you have also, you sometimes you have a very big drop in, um, in, um, in temperature. So that's just to show you, like, you know, how do we calculate that temperature? But you have uh, charts for, and I think maybe Whitson, he shows one chart like that, of DP, oh, no, I know where it is. Okay, just let me show you one of these charts. Okay, just to show you another way to look at the same chart, but in a slightly simpler way, but now you know how it, it was constructed. Okay, you have the initial pressure, the pressure upstream the choke, then you have the delta P that you have across the choke, and then from there you can read the temperature drop. Okay, so we have charts like that, and they are made for different types of gases, they are made for different DPs, they are made for a different variation, but now you know where it came from. Okay, just making the enthalpy is the same, and then I can compute, I can make the computation. Okay, especially across chokes, so we have some charts, okay, that give you, with delta P, inlet pressure, how much is a pressure drop. You find that in many, uh, many books. Okay, now let's take a break. You know, it's three, so let's take 15 minutes break, and then we come back with the rest. Okay, so then, very simply, we already have pressure and temperature. We just drag down, right? And then we get a significant, remember, these two points are one next to the other. Okay, you have the upstream of the choke, the choke is maybe half a meter, a meter, okay? And then you have another point very close to it. And you see the change that you have already in, in water content, okay? So you get a lot of water that comes out of solution during that choke. Okay? If for any reason, where were we? Here, if for any reason, the temperature goes even lower, okay? You can go even to negative. You can also cause freezing of this water. Yeah, and then you have some plug inside the choke, and then you cause a lot of problems. Okay, so but in, that doesn't happen in this case. Okay. Then I have the separator, and I know how much I have there, 300. So all of this from here to here is depositing in the main transportation line. Okay, from, from the plem, what we are looking here, from the plem, all the way to to Melkoya. Yeah. Okay. So now simply let's create here one more column that will give me the Q of water. Okay. And that I will use the unit standard cubic meter. Per day. Okay, and I simply want to multiply, so how do I make my calculation to know how much water I have in the separator? Or how much water do I have at this point? Okay, when I receive my stream there. Okay, let's make it maybe on the side. Okay, or maybe let's copy this table. That will be easier.
Okay, see the units, these are at standard conditions, okay? Okay, so now we want to calculate how much water at standard conditions I'm expected to have at the separator. So the total amount of water, right, Q water total, at standard conditions, is equal to simply the Q of the gas total, right, times RSW at reservoir pressure and reservoir temperature. Okay, that we have done that calculation before. That's how much we have. If we take it everything to standard conditions, we know that um, Q water total was how much? 20 million okay, times, and we have should put this in million, okay, so we use 20 million standard cubic meter per day times RS, which is 3360 uh, standard cubic meter per million standard cubic meter. Okay, and how much is that? Q water total. Yeah, we need to make some multiplication here. Um, I don't want to put it here, but let's make it here. Maybe Q water total. That's how much is dissolved in, in, uh, so I have to multiply this guy, divided by 1 million, and then multiply times this guy, okay? Okay, 67,000, I think a similar number, that's what we found before, yesterday. Okay, 62,000, 62, 67.2,000. Okay, that's how much water you have in total, okay? But how much do I have free water when it arrives to the separator? Okay, when I go on this separator, on this point, when I look exactly here, at that point in the system, okay, I have my separator, okay, which in this case looks like, we're not going to go into too many details, but looks like a very long pipe. It doesn't look like a regular separator, because it's like a slug catcher. Okay, and we know this rate is roughly this 20 million, right? But we want to know also how much water I'm going to, free water I'm going to have in there, okay? So then I can do one thing, right? I can say, how much do I still have in solution in the gas at separator conditions? How much is that? Q water at separator conditions, okay? That I still have in solution, okay? So that will be 20, million times the RSW at reservoir pressure and reservoir temperature, okay? That's how much I still have inside, these 20 million still have some, some water inside, okay? And that's how I calculate how much water is still inside, okay? Is it still in solution in the, in the gas? So how much is that? QW separator, that way, let's call it in solution. Okay, still in solution. Uh, then we have 20 e to the 6, or 20, simply 20. Okay, multiply times RSW, which is 310. Okay, how much is that? That's what I have in solution, and that's... Um, 
6,000 uh, is that that amount, right? 60, uh, 6,200. Yeah, I think so. Okay. That means that how much free water do we have at separator? The free water at the separator is the difference, right, between the two. Okay. That means Q water total minus, so let's say Q water at the separator, free, let's call it here free. Okay, the free water is the total that I have minus what actually the gas now has at that reduced pressure and temperature. Okay, which is Q water separator in solution. Okay, and that is 67,000. We're using point. Minus um, six thousand okay, and how much is that? So, Q water that the separator, whatever arrives to that separator in um, in Melkoya, it's um, six point uh, sixty one. Uh, e to the 3 okay. and that's a very useful number that helps you to size your separator okay. as you already covered with Mariana she probably told you you have some residence time right where you divide the volume of your separator dividing by the rate okay now I have the rate if the residence time has to be maybe three minutes four minutes okay already know how big my separator has to be Okay, that number already gives you a very good indication. Okay, 60, 61. Now, if I want to know, that's the rate at standard conditions. Okay, that is the rate, if you remember what we have done. We have a process, right, where we find this volume of water. Okay. Sorry, not gas, but water. So now we want to find what is the volume of water at local conditions. And for that we use this BW. Okay, because the units are different. This unit is in standard cubic meter. That's what the small RS is giving you. Okay, but typically for the size, for sizing, you need is actually the actual number in cubic meter, okay, per day. So that's why you have to take one more step but remember, this BW is very small, so really it doesn't make any any big doesn't make any big difference. Okay, but in theory, you want to calculate the local water free water rate at separator inlet. Okay. Then you need to take the Q. Now it's not, you know, all of these, they had a bar, okay, on top. This one doesn't have a bar, free, at the separator. That will be equal to Q water at the separator, free, multiplied times PW. That is a function of P separator and T separator. Okay, and we said this number, you don't have to worry about it, but it's typically very similar to one. Okay, so effectively you have to deal with 61,000 standard cubic meter per day, which is uh, huge. Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, 61 million liters of water you have to dispose. Okay, but you can do exactly the same procedure, and that's the second exercise you're going to get from me. I think it's also the third one, right? Mariana gave you one. No? Okay. Yeah, probably she forgot. But uh, I'm not going to forget, okay? So, 
So you're going to get an exercise that is going to be very similar, but you will have to calculate this free water in different places in the field. Okay? And we're going to see now why that is important with an example of another problem we typically have in the field. Okay, so far in this exercise or in this example, we have calculated simply here. Okay, we made the difference between what we have, the maximum, the total that we have, and here. But you can also make the difference with any place in the system. You can make it at the wellhead, and then you know how much you have there. That's very useful for this calculation. Okay, to know if that liquid will cause a problem or not. You can make it on the, f on the flow line. So you will have for the exercise to make a similar um, exercise set to, you have to make a similar calculation, but you know, in another location. Okay, but be careful. Need to calculate the total, add standard conditions, take out what the separator has at standard conditions still in solution, what the gas still has, Okay, and then the difference that I still have to convert to local conditions. Okay, it's a bit strange this concept, this ratio, but you get used to it. Okay, you have to be always careful about the units. Okay, what is in standard conditions and what is in local conditions, local pressure and temperature. Okay, now we go with the last part of the class which is very, um, very briefly, we want to talk about, so why besides knowing, you know, the rate, so knowing, knowing, forgot how to write knowing, it's knowing, like that, right? That happens when you go to too many meetings, your brain gets, you know, damaged. So you stop thinking. Okay, knowing Q water, okay, at any, that's, okay, doesn't have the bar, okay, so that's at local conditions. Okay, is useful, is very useful, okay, for, for example, pressure drop calculations. If you have water, remember, increase the density, increases the viscosity, and then causes significantly uh, a, a significant difference in the pressure drop calculation. Then we had liquid loading. So not only is to determine if there is a liquid loading problem, to determine liquid loading Also, you need it for you need it for corrosion. Okay, corrosion. Typically, we add some kind of, and we are going to see that now with hydrate. We add some chemical together with the water, okay, to avoid that you will have corrosion. But to know how much of this chemical you have to inject, this is like whiskey, okay, or it's like a very like uh, aquavit, okay, very expensive. You don't want to put more than what you really need. Okay, if you put too much, you're spending too much money unnecessary. So you always have to find a way to find the uh, adequate amount of chemicals, of chemical inhibitor, for example, for purposes of corrosion. Because if all the water simply is dissolving the gas, is not going to cause any corrosion, okay? It's in vapor phase, so it doesn't cause any problem. It's only when you have free water, then you have an issue. But then if you have a little bit, you don't want to inject too many, a lot of quantities, right? Because then that corrosion typically is something you buy and you cannot recover, you lose it. Okay, so, and also hydrates. Okay, and we're going to go, that's what we're going to look at now. Okay? So, we had a guest lecture on hydrates, okay? So I shouldn't be 
you know, ex re-explaining that, but I think none of you were there, okay? So I have to re-explain it. You were there. So you're going to help me with the lecture today, okay? So I have to, to repeat a little bit, okay? But hydrates basically is like, a, it's like an ice-like structure, and it looks like that. Let me show you. That's very, okay, it looks like that. That's how a, it's like solid ice. But it's made, it's very, it's very interesting. Okay, so it looks like, uh, like ice, and essentially it can block your pipe. It causes a big plug in the pipe that you can then, you know, obstructs production and you cannot produce anymore. You have to do something to remove that plug. And the reason why it is formed, you have to have some ingredients for hydrate to form, okay? The first ingredient, you need to have this free water that we know where it can come from, okay? From this gas, simply the gas will release, okay? Then you need to have small molecules. And these molecules can be methane, can be ethane, for example, can be even propane, can be sometimes butane, okay, not so often, but sometimes butane, an isobutane, and sometimes can be CO2 and can be nitrogen. The molecule has to be relatively small, okay? We are talking nine Armstrong, okay? How much is an Armstrong? That's from Bidere Goenne. You thought you were never going to use Armstrong again in your life. And now I come back and I told you I'm strong, you're afraid. Okay. Minus 10, right? 10 to the minus 10 meters. So if they are this size, the thing is that, remember, the, you need to have free water. Why? Because in water we have this hydrogen bond. And don't get scared. You know, I, I, I'm not very f fond of chemistry. Okay? But, you know, it's sometimes we have to go to understand things. If you remember the, the water molecule, okay, we have H, we are having an electron, okay, then you have oxygen, okay, then we have another bond here, but the oxygen has two electrons on its back, okay. and that causes, because of that, it tends to push the uh, it tends it tends to keep like you know things to itself keep the electrons but push the uh, the hydrogen the positive charge okay because of that the molecule actually causes some is causes some difference in charge okay you have negative charge in the back of the oxygen and you have two positive charge where the hydrogens are okay so it's very polar okay it's a dipole because of that it tends to have also affinity with other mole molecules that are neighboring, okay? If you have here, for example, this hydrogen, you have your oxygen that has also a charge, negative charge, and then you have another hydrogen and so forth, okay? So it tends to, to arrange itself because of this polarity, okay? And then with the reduction in pressure and temperature, and that's the other condition, so specific conditions of pressure and temperature, of pressure and temperature is usually low pressure low temperature and it can be yeah usually let's say low temperature okay so then it starts to form when it starts to get to, to get solidified okay it starts to form this structure which is like a cage if you see here you have the oxygen in red again okay, you have the two hydrogens and some of them are this covalent bond and some of them are this hydrogen, very weak due to the polarity, okay? But they tend to make a house to build it. They are, these are guys are builders, okay? They tend to make a cage. And in this cage, you have, if you have one of these molecules that are free flowing with the gas, okay, which is methane, ethane, they just go inside, okay? And they, they are lodged there, okay? And then finally it gets completely hard and then you get a blockage in the pipe. But you need to have these three conditions, okay? Free water, 
such that they build the house, okay? You need to have the tenant, the guy that is going to live inside the house, okay? And then you need to have some conditions of pressure and temperature. That we call it, you know, they need to have running water and they need to have electricity to survive in this house. Okay? So, these conditions of pressure and temperature, if you're going to make a plot, okay, of pressure and temperature, they look something like that. Um, yeah. If you see... If you see on the chart, actually, you can see a little bit on this, uh, the solubility chart that I gave you, okay? If you pay attention very closely, you see that something is there that says hydrate formation line. Do you see it? Okay. So the curve that I'm talking about, okay, is relatively, actually it's very flat, okay? It's not exactly as I painted here, but it's actually very, very flat initially and then it's going increasing very rapidly okay and that's exactly what you see there at low pressure let me just pull it here it's not here it's not here is no place to be found Okay, you see here, that's exactly that behavior with temperature, okay? That marks the hydrate line. Everything that is below that temperature or everything that is also below that pressure, you're going to have hydrate formation, okay? And here, actually, at low pressure, it becomes relatively flat because you have a very steep, you have a very steep, also that's logarithmic scale, okay? So it makes it look like it's very flat, okay? So it's very flat and starting to go up. And you have two main regions. This here is hydrate free. Okay. And here is hydrate risk of hydrate formation. Okay, but remember, only if you have all the other conditions. You need to have free water. It doesn't matter that you're inside. If you have no free water, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? In gas transportation pipeline, for example, they might be inside that region, but they don't have any water. They guarantee that they took away all the water. Okay? And you need to have the, not the small molecules okay? around 9 Armstrong. So if you look at your pipe, okay, now we have painted here. Let me bring it down as pressure and temperature of the hydrate zone. But if you look at the pressure and temperature drop in the pipe, okay, or in any place in your production system, hydrate can happen any place, okay? Can happen in pipeline, can happen in the well, can, can occur in, uh, in the topside facilities. Actually, it's very common in topside facilities, okay, where the temperature is lowest. But you start usually at high pressure and high temperature in the reservoir. Okay. Then you flow, typically, let's make the, just make it a bit higher. Okay. What is the next point you find? The bottom hole pressure, right? We reduce pressure, PWF, TR. Typically, in that transition from the reservoir to the bottom of the well, temperature doesn't change much. Okay. But after that, actually, te both temperature and pressure are going to change. Okay, some place I might have here the wellhead pressure, wellhead temperature, until I reach the separator. And the main thing, or the big question that you will have to answer if you're working on engineering company or on an operator company, is if the, the two lines cross. Okay, if one crosses, and here is very important and very fundamental to, to be able to predict, to predict the cooling 
of fluid in the pipe. Okay, and that you're going to cover with Professor Asheim. Harald, he will come and teach you about cooling in pipe. How the cooling happens, how you can predict it, but really the main application to find is if it's going to cross or not this line. Okay, it's very important and it's very fundamental. It's something that I can apply conservation equations and I can, and I can solve. Okay? Now, what are the ways to avoid hydro formation? How can I avoid hydro formation? Okay. One way is to slow down the cooling in the pipe. Okay. And that how can I do it? Slow down, let's put it here, slow down the cooling in the pipe. For example, with insulation, right? The heat transfer, how much I'm transferring depends on the area and also on the resistance that I have, right? If we see, people like to make an electrical analogy, okay, they have the pipe wall and then they have, for example, they have simply here the temperature of the sea. And here I have the temperature of the fluid. They like to see at those two temperatures as voltages, and then you have some resistance in between. And the current is actually the heat transfer that you have. So if you have more layers, more insulation, then you have less heat transfer. Okay? Therefore, this one cools uh, less. And that is typically made by insulation. Okay? The other option I have is not slow down, but actually giving heat to the, right? I'm losing heat, but I can also add heat. And how do I add heat to the pipe? I do that by, um, and there are different ways to make insulation. We are not going to talk about it. Add heat, I make it basically through heat tracing. Okay, I simply wrap the pipe and I think we had a lecture from Statoil from Equinor last year on that. Okay, I simply put a cable and I circulate a current and then from there I create some heating. I induce some heating on the pipe. Okay. But Sometimes I cannot avoid, no matter what I do, especially in this case, remember that pipe is 140 kilometers. So first to put isolation through all the pipe will be very expensive. To heat all the pipe will be very expensive. And also remember what happened with the gas related to this example. What happened with pressure decreased? The temperature was also dropping, was not due to heat transfer, was simply because the pressure was dropping. Okay. So actually in this pipe, we have made some simulations okay, for the Snow White case. Okay. Actually we have made some simulations. We have the length of the pipe and the temperature. And initially you have temperature at the wellhead, 70. But then it starts to go down and even goes below the seabed temperature. which is very strange, right? Because you say, well, here, that's lower, right? So I have heat transfer on this direction. I have heat transfer on this direction. But then at some point, actually, the environment is heating the fluid, which is crazy, right? That temperature is like four degrees Celsius in the barren sea, okay? And that's because that decline in a gas, when you have mainly gas, is not only due to cooling, but to the Joule-Thompson Joule effect. You have a reduction in pressure and then you have also some cooling effect. Very strange, counterintuitive. Okay. So for all of those reasons, sometimes we don't have another choice, but we use chemical inhibitor. Okay. And typically we use methanol 
monoethylene glycol make and three ethylene glycol take. The idea is that these molecules are also very, very polar. Okay, they also have a big polarity. MaOH, okay, is uh, methanol, C, okay, and then you have an OH. Oxygen is always a troublemaker, okay? So this oxygen, it likes to keep electrons by itself, and at the end you end up with a molecule that has positive charge and negative charge here. And then they can actually meet with this molecule here, and they can stop from building the house, okay? They can try to sabotage the, bu the building of this house, okay? But up to certain temperature, when you reduce too much the temperature, then the house will eventually form, okay? But the effect of the chemical inhibitor is basically, I inject these guys, okay, with the flow. But basically, is that they reduce the area of hydrate, okay? That's no inhibitor. But then if I add inhibitor, it might look something like that. With inhibitor. Okay? And if I put even more inhibitor, I might reduce it further and further. Therefore, if in my pipe it goes like that, okay, I can know exactly how much, and I have the curves, I can know exactly how much inhibitor I have to inject to avoid having hydrate on the line. Okay? The inhibitor concentration is typically given in uh, weight percent. Inhibitor quantity. In a uh, weight percent. Okay, and that means based on the water, okay? So that means mass of the inhibitor divided by the mass that's in kilogram per second, okay? Divided by the mass of the inhibitor plus the mass of the water, okay? Multiplied by 100, <coughs> the concentration, okay? And this number can be Typically, something between 30 and maybe 60 percent maximum. Okay? That means sometimes you have to inject as much inhibitor as water you have. Okay? That's the case of Snow White, for example. And now we come back to the question at the starting of the lecture, okay? That why on earth do we want to know how much water we have? Why is it important? Okay? This inhibitor, let me see if I have the cost here. I have an example with the cost someplace here. Okay, methanol is costing, for this field I make a rough calculation, okay? And that means I have to buy, this cost 0.5 to 1.5 US dollar per kilogram of inhibitor, okay? So if I have to buy and I have to inject that inhibitor and I have to add 70,000, how much was it? 70 million liters, right? That's a big expense that I have to pay for that, okay? So that's another reason why you need to know how much water you have. And remember, the amount of water will change in the system. So then you have to inject for the most, the, the most, the worst case, right? Maybe in the well you don't have that much, but then at later on the flow line, then you will have more water, okay? So you should inject always for the worst case scenario, okay? Where you have the most water. This is injected, is injected typically at the wellhead. Okay, it's typically injected at the Christmas tree. Not going to go too much in detail, that's for another course, but basically 
that's how the tree looks like. You have some valves here is coming fluid out. You have the choke, okay? And then you inject before the choke, that's where you inject this line, okay? This inhibitor. That's also very important. If you're going to shut down your system, when you shut down, the temperature will go down eventually. Okay? You will reach, you will be inside this area eventually. So you want to float and you want to inject with inhibitor. Okay, that's all I had to say about hydrate. You're going to get an exercise, like I mentioned on that, and maybe a small thing to estimate hydrate quantity, amount. Okay? But then we go, next week, we're going to talk about uh, gas dehydration. Now we saw why we don't like water in any place. Uh, so the next step is to, to dehydrate. Before we send it to export, before we transport, we want to take out all the water from this gas. And for that we use something called uh, dehydration with, uh, with glycol that we do in a tower. Okay. Before we finish, any question? Yes? Is this a typical problem on the water you can take out? Is it like covering all the gas that we have to inject? Always when you have free water and when you have gas, you have to, you can, you could have a hybrid, okay? And you could be inside the region here, always. But if you inject, usually the strategy, the most common is that you inject this glycol, okay? Sometimes the distance is very short, so during normal operation, you don't need to inject any, any inhibitor. Okay, but when you stop, you surely have to inject chemicals. You need to inject it b before it cools down. Okay? But it's always, especially here, it's cold, so it's, uh, you have this, this issue. Okay? Um, I just want if the members of the reference group is you, Susan, and Trikve. Yeah? So if we can meet, we, we, I would like to have the first meeting, if you have time, just now, very shortly. Yes? yes? You have time? Okay, so just to get your impression, if there is something that has to be improved, if, uh, okay? Okay.